Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. If you had a problem with the cool this morning, uh, you could uh, be like our friends up where we lived in New York that have over a foot of snow this morning and still, still snowing, I think, so it could be worse. <laughs> So, uh, cost of living was not the only reason we moved back from New York. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we don't miss this time of year up there at all because it'll it'll be snowing from now till March, and uh, we don't certainly don't uh, miss that. So, uh, we do have session meeting. It, uh, Tuesday, 12.30. And uh, so anybody else have any announcements uh, this morning? So this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Father, for this opportunity once again to be in your house, to move further into this new year with your guidance, your direction, your promptings. Watch over us as we seek to serve you, to reach others for you, uh, to be their guide as we uh, call on you to show us what you would have for us to do. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Let us uh, begin our worship uh, responsively. Jesus Christ, the great physician, invites us into the healing presence of God, our refuge. God knew us before we were born and summoned us to service in our youth. God, our rock and fortress, rescues us from injustice, cruelty, and wickedness. God touches our lips and puts words in our mouths. God commands us to speak and removes our fears. God, our hope and trust, meets us where we are and leads us to times of witness and praise. God's revelation comes in unexpected places to meet our needs and empower our service. Now let us worship our wonderful Lord by turning to hymn number 292 and we will sing God of Grace and God of glory.
confession, we who take for granted the abundance and freedom we enjoy are summoned to recognize the sovereignty and generosity of God. We who are blind to the mystery of God's presence among us and insistent on our own way are brought face to face with love and here recognize our sin. Let us seek the forgiveness of God. Let us share together in our prayer of confession. O oh God, we have been noisy gongs and clanging cymbals, impressed with our own knowledge and misled by childish reasoning. We have mistaken our hazy insights for your truth and have resented others for whom your love is life-changing. Forgive not only our arrogance, gracious God, but also our timidity. Equip us for an authentic witness to your love. Amen. Hear the good word of our Lord if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Our God says to us, do not be afraid. I am with you to deliver you. God rescues us from wickedness, injustice, and cruelty. With God's help, we can leave childish ways behind because we are understood by God we can grow in understanding. So faith, hope, and love abide in you. And love is the greatest of all God's gifts. Let us celebrate our forgiveness now by singing the Gloria Patri number 623. Church, what do we believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, 
being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Time for joys and concerns this morning. Um, Bill's friend Ron that he's brought to us is not doing well. He's in the hospital and in very serious condition. So please be in prayer for Ron. Uh, don't know what God's plan is, but let's put him, Ron, in God's hands and leave it up to him. Others, Sherry. Okay. Sherry's nephew said to have a biopsy on his head, and let's be praying for the results that uh, it's not uh, not a serious problem. There. Yeah. So other other can. Barbara and Rich there for their medical issues. Barb. Barb's, Barb's niece is in radiation treatments, and for those of us who had family and friends that have been through that, we know that that's a, a difficult process to go through on your body, so be in prayer for her. So, um, I hope Jane is up uh, with her daughter. She has cold. Jane has cold. So be praying for Jane. We miss her. And uh, others. Uh, we need to be in prayer for this uh, Martha, who has been having so many seizures. He's yeah. been scheduled to have his surgery on the 18th of this month. Yes. And hopefully we pray that that will work and eliminate these seizures. 
Absolutely, yes. We'll continue praying for Micah as his, he does have this surgery schedule that hopefully will uh, minimize the problem in him and and uh, give give him his life back. That's got to be a terrible feeling, not knowing. Uh, we had a friend that uh, was in um, Afghanistan and also at Ground Zero, a friend up in New York. And he, uh, while he was in Afghanistan, he got some kind of strange malady like that where he simply passed out and never knew when that was going to happen to him and had that for for several years before they were able to get that under control. So we can empathize with Micah and what our friend went through up in New York. So continue to be praying for him. Others? Pastor? Thank you, Harry. You notice it looks a little bit different up here this morning. Uh, my beloved wife... Uh, was wiped out physically and uh, could not be with us to, today. Uh, she occasionally suffers from back aches, and uh, so I, being the dutiful, loving husband that I am, tried to massage her back last night to help her get to sleep, and uh, she wouldn't go to sleep. And when I woke up this morning, she was still awake. And I said, honey, you haven't been up all night, have you? And she said, yes. And I said, well, don't you usually go to sleep when I rub your back? And she said, well, it just felt so good. I didn't want to go to sleep. <laughs> and I said, well, I wish I'd have known that. I would have quit so you could get some sleep. But... Uh, Anyway, so she's just totally wiped out this morning, and I know uh, I need some rest, and I pray that there won't be all kind of scammer callers this morning that'll be calling on her phone and waking her up and things like that. I've set it back in the kitchen, so hopefully it won't disturb her. So I appreciate your prayers for Angela. Let's uh, go to the Lord now and remember these who have asked an interest in our prayers. Father, it's so good that we can come into your presence and we can know that you hear us, not because of any great worthiness of, upon our, on our part, but because of your great love for us and because of the imputed righteousness that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. And, and I, I just pray, Lord, that as we come before you now, we come with all confidence and boldness knowing that you do hear and answer prayer, knowing that whether we come to you with our joys or we come to you with our concerns or we come to you with both, that you are there for us. And I pray that you will continue to show us how we can be better servants of yours in uh, going forth into this world, sharing the good news of your glorious gospel and your power of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you always do hear and answer prayer. So we are bold to pray that prayer that you, our Master, have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> In this imperfect world, God entrusts love to us and bids us share it in practical and helpful ways. Our offerings are one response we make to the love of God poured out in Jesus Christ. We pass on that love in word and deed as we commit our gifts to God's purposes.
No stand, he was singing the doxology. Praise God for I invite you to turn in the Bible with me in your Bibles to Matthew, the sixth chapter. And this morning we're going to be thinking about the kingdom. We're going to ask four basic questions. What is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom? When is the kingdom? And how do you enter the kingdom? So let's see if we can find the answer to those four questions in our scripture and our study this morning. So if you would turn with me to Matthew, the sixth chapter, we will begin reading with verse 25 through 33. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Today we wind up the Christmas tide uh, with Epiphany. Epiphany was actually yesterday, as far as on the calendar, but this is our Epiphany Sunday, in which we celebrate the visit of the Magi to see the newborn king in Bethlehem. So I thought that was highly appropriate to think about the kingdom this morning. We are celebrating their coming and bringing their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Someone has pointed out that gold is the gift of a king frankincense can be called the gift of a priest, but it is also the gift that the priest offers God. So could it be that these visitors 
to Bethlehem to see the Christ child are saying that not only is this child born to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but that he is actually the Son of God. And then myrrh is a gift that you give to someone who is dying. It would be the equivalent of bringing a, bomb, a bombing fluid if you were in, uh, embalming fluid, <laughs> yeah, embalming fluid, uh, to attend a baby's uh, celebration of a baby's birth. Yeah, I know I see some strange wrinkled up faces here going, really? Well, that's what more was. It was for someone who was to die. And we know that Jesus is the only human being that was as much God as, 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 as he was human, but at the same time, born for the express purpose of dying. And so we see in these kingdom visitors, the Magi, this celebration of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. They come celebrating his royalty. They come celebrating his divinity. And they come celebrating the fact that he will accomplish much through his death. And that is the very purpose of his life. So as we seek the kingdom of God, may we be like these who are willing to come from afar, to come all this great distance, to go through all of that time and all of the commitment to seek the kingdom. We pray every day for the kingdom, don't we? Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there is a lot that the Bible tells us about the kingdom. And one of the things it tells us is that the kingdom is more than just the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom that we will one day go to. But that it is more also than the kingdom of the church that it is greater than even these two entities, heaven and the church. The kingdom is the reign of God over the entire universe of his creation. So when we're thinking about the kingdom, we're, we're thinking in very large terms. We're painting with very broad strokes we're being very non-sectarian. Just like I say, this is a non-sectarian meal. This is for the believers in Christ. If you believe in Christ and you're with us and uh, you're not a member of our fellowship, that doesn't matter. We want to celebrate Holy Communion with you in a little bit. But uh, so we celebrate the kingdom this morning. There is much that Jesus teaches us about the kingdom. The Bible tells us in the gospel accounts of both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus went about preaching the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse, it says, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in Mark 1, 5, uh, he, after it says, after his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, Jesus began to preach that the time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, just briefly, what is he talking about when he says repentance? He is talking about changing your mind, changing your heart, 
changing your direction more than just quitting this bad habit or quitting that addiction. He's talking about simply putting your trust in Him alone for your salvation, believing in what He has accomplished for us in the kingdom. That is repentance, turning from yourself to trust in Him, turning from all of your accomplishments or works in life to trust in His grace alone for our salvation. In Luke 4.43, Jesus said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I am sent for that purpose. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. In John 3, 5, he said, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God? We often refer to the kingdom of God as the kingdom of heaven because it is often written that way. And one of the reasons that the kingdom of God is called the kingdom of heaven is because you remember the children of Israel were terrified about using the name of the Lord. And so uh, oftentimes they would substitute something like heaven in its place instead of saying the kingdom of God, they'd say the kingdom of heaven. So the Bible says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom is more than meat and drink. Well, if it is more than meat and drink, it is more than physical. It is more than our physical desires or our physical cravings. And Jesus himself has addressed those by saying, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. Does that affect us? I mean, how many of us worry about what we eat? Well, most of us are concerned, right? I mean, I think about it. I come in and say, hon, what's for supper? Or what's for lunch? Or what's for breakfast? You know? And uh, I imagine you do the same thing too. So I'm, I'm thinking that when he says, take no thought about these things, I think the word there carries with it the idea of worrying about it. It's okay to plan. It's okay to prepare. In fact, we're told that it is wisdom to do so. And uh, so there's nothing wrong with, with wearing nice clothes, I guess, if you can afford them. But, uh, and there's nothing wrong with having good food uh, as well. But should those be our pursuits in life? And the answer is no. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all of these things will be added to us. That's a promise. If we attend to the kingdom first, then we have a right to say, Lord, we are attending to your business. We know you will take care of us. And I think that pleases the Father. It is, what is the kingdom then if it's not meat and drink? It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I just like to say the, that verse, say it out loud to myself, to remind myself that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. As we're narrowing down this idea of what is the kingdom, if the kingdom is not physical, it is not material, then Jesus says it is not of this world, nor is it from this world. 
The weapons of this world are not to be tools to be used to advance the kingdom. Someone has said that's a very good answer for the question of separation of church and state. God never intends for the state to bring in the kingdom. He intends for it to be his sole propriety. He will bring in the kingdom. And he has already brought the kingdom, uh, initiated that bringing in the kingdom by sending his son into the world to be our savior. And then one day he will consummate the kingdom when Jesus Christ returns to come back to earth to reign, not to just kind of take over a small part of the earth, but to reign over the whole of his creation. So the first question was, what is the kingdom? And the answer to that is it is the reign of God over the whole of his creation. That his will will be done as we pray every day, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is when we know that the kingdom has truly come. You know, there were a lot of people that thought that, uh, that because of our missionary efforts, that uh, if we sent enough missionaries around the world and we converted enough of the nations to Christianity and actually preached the gospel to every person in the world, then the kingdom would come. How's that working out for you? You know, we sing that beautiful hymn, we've a story to tell to the nation, and it said, and the kingdom will come of love and light. Has it gotten lighter in this world? I think it has gotten darker. And so this idea of the kingdom coming in by our own efforts as noble and as as righteous as they may be, it is His divine initiative and prerogative that He will bring in the kingdom as He sees fit. As we are being equipped to be His servants, this is our greatest concern. Am I being fit for this kingdom that He is bringing in? Is he working on you and me to make us fit? The kingdom is not material. So where is the kingdom? It is spiritual. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus said it is invisible. It can only be seen by faith. And it can only be entered by acceptance of an invitation and a commitment. And that work of faith is also called a gift of grace. So, what is the kingdom? It's a mystery. It's a divine, holy mystery. But that doesn't make it unreal, does it? Some of the, the most beautiful things about our faith are the mysteries. Because, you know, we, we got into the 70s and I guess earlier than that, uh, ministry began to be called therapy. You know, it was like healing and, and everything we did, even worship began to be so centered around, well, what I, I like to go to that church because of what it does for me, you know. Well, that's not the goal of being a part of a fellowship. It's not what it does for us. It's what God can do in us and through us to allow us to be his servants and to be effective in sharing the gospel of Christ with the world. And uh, so there are mysteries. And they're there. So we will scratch our heads. So we'll say that doesn't make sense. God is 100% in, I mean, Jesus is 100% God. 
And Jesus is 100% man. Can you do the math? To do it otherwise is heresy. Because then you are preaching that he was not completely human. Or he was not completely divine. It's a divine mystery. The kingdom. When Jesus talks about the kingdom, if anybody should understand the kingdom, it is Jesus. But look at some of his parables. He's over here with this illustration. He's over here with that one. Over here with this one and with that one. And, you know, sometimes they come on top of each other, you know. And to try to understand the kingdom just from his parables can leave your scratch in your head. But what is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom? When is the kingdom? Don't we sometimes think that one day the kingdom will come? Has not the kingdom already come through Christ? Uh, Jesus himself said in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Neither shall they say, lo, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom is within you, within our midst. Why was the kingdom with them when Jesus said that? Because the king was with them. And wherever the king is, that is the manifestation of the kingdom. So, what is the kingdom? It's a divine mystery. Where is the kingdom? It's wherever the king is. When is the kingdom? It is according to God's divine initiative and God's divine plan as it unfolds throughout all of creation. And how, and this should be our biggest question for anyone, especially those of you that are catching our program at home, and, uh, and that's the question, how do you enter the kingdom? Well, first of all, you have to hear the gospel. And God uses the gospel that God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself. And what Jesus did for you and me on the cross that we could never do for ourselves. Simply receiving that truth in childlike faith. Hearing the gospel. And then accepting the bad news first. I'll never be good enough to make it into the kingdom by my own will efforts my own initiative that's the bad news no matter if you were to give your body to be burned paul said in in first corinthians the 13th chapter and you don't have the love of christ in your heart you've just wasted your substance you've wasted who you are we'll never be good enough to enter the kingdom so how do we enter the kingdom? We accept the good news. We've accepted the bad news. We'll never be good enough. The Pharisees didn't want to accept that. They didn't want to accept that they would never be good enough. They came up with a new plan to always be good enough, to always satisfy the law, to always be what God, uh, they felt, wanted them to be. But we have to accept the bad news. We'll never be good enough. We'll never be righteous enough. We have to then accept the good news and repent. And that word metanoia in the Greek it just simply means to turn around. To stop thinking with our mind and think with our heart. And to turn around from trusting ourselves and all of our righteousness to trusting what God has done for us in Christ and confess that truth of our insufficiency and thank Jesus for dying on the cross for us and thereby granting us an initiation and an invitation rather 
to be forgiven, and to be invited to enter God's kingdom. That's the way it looks on the earthly plane. Then on the heavenly plane, we see according to Colossians 1.13, we see that we have been delivered out of the darkness of sin and transported into the kingdom of God's dear only begotten Son, Jesus. So on an earthly plane, these are the things that we do. We come under conviction by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. We confess our sin. We turn from trusting in ourselves to, by repentance to trusting in Him for what He has done for us. We receive Him into our hearts by faith. He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. We receive an imputed righteousness, not a righteousness that we have earned or deserved, but a gift of His divine grace that there was a double imputation here. Our sins were imputed to Him and His salvation and His grace and His righteousness was imputed or credited to us. So on an earthly plane, it looks that way, but then on the heavenly plane, it is a sign of deliverance out of the darkness of sin and a transportation, a transference into the kingdom of God's dear only begotten Son. So physically, the person is still here in this world and still has to deal with the weaknesses and temptations and limits of life. But the new believer has changed his or her spiritual address. This is why St. Paul described this way in Ephesians 2.6. He said, we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Other things have happened to allow this transference. God has forgiven us our sin and He's cut away our old sinful nature, making us new creatures in Christ, a whole new creation and giving us a whole new nature. We have then been joined to Christ and have been made to sit right where Jesus Christ is. That's why Paul said we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And furthermore, we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit who is working in us to transform us, to fit us for heaven. That's salvation. Colossians 1.13 says that we're saved from the kingdom of the sin and darkness, saved to the kingdom of God's dear Son. Paul likes to use analogies that take the life of Christ to understand. He said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. Galatians 2.20. In Colossians 2.12 and 13, in Romans 6.4 and 5, he says that not only are we crucified with Christ, we are buried with Him in baptism so that we might be raised to walk in newness of life raised, resurrected. And then in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, he says not only are we buried, uh, crucified with Christ and buried with Him in baptism and raised by the power of His resurrection, but we have ascended to heaven and are seated at the, with Christ in heaven, in heavenly places. There's an lot, awful lot to celebrate about the kingdom. Because of what it is, and we've studied where it is and when it is. But if you made the decision for your own life, that maybe in hearing this message, you said, I've never really become a kingdom citizen. You're invited. Every time the gospel is preached, and the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. You're invited to open the door 
In Revelation 3.20, he said, Behold, I stand and knock at your heart's door. And your only response is to open the door and let him come in. Let in the king and we become citizens of his kingdom. Let us celebrate one of the aspects of being kingdom citizens, the divine holy communion. Our kingdom meal. I invite you to take your worship sheet and uh, let us begin the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and to heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me.
Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising. As we await the day of his coming with thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Now, if you would, please take your cup and peel back the clear seal on top, and you will see the wafer. If you would, please hold the wafer in your hand. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Now, if you would peel back the rest of the cup, the whole seal underneath the plastic clear seal. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O oh God, that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now let us uh, share in our hymn of dedication. Please turn to page number 42. We'll give you a moment to find it. And this is Seek Ye First. Benediction, 
And now, Lord, as you have fed us with your divine holy word, which is the bread of life, and you have allowed us to feast upon the body of Jesus Christ and his blood, uh, which is the bread of heaven and the cup of our salvation. We are strengthened now by your grace. Send us forth into this world to be your ambassadors of grace, mercy, and peace, your agents of salt and light. With the gospel of Jesus Christ in our hearts and on our lips, and the message, the great message of your kingdom to this world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, we do pray. Amen. serve the Lord. Mm -hmm.